So, this slide we already saw, so we do not want to get into this, but let us say uh, if we look at this one and try to draw a resistance network for a laptop CPU, how will it look like? So, I can draw it within this manner. So, if I have to do junction to ambient, there will be something from the package, package in this case we are talking about uh, in the silicon itself, then the TIM thermal interface material. Then the heat pipe we have divided into three thermal resistances, one is for the evaporator which is where which is the hot junction, one is the adiabatic which is calling heat pipe to heat exchanger and then the heat exchanger to ambient. So, if I, I may write them in this manner. So, if I for example, if I put thermocouples at these different locations at the silicon at the base over here, uh, then at the entry of the heats of the heat exchanger I can calculate or at least measure all these individual thermal resistances. Now, these numbers are a little dated, um, these have changed, but that is not the point. What I am trying to show is if I look at the relative contributions of each of these thermal uh, resistances, this is how they line up. Okay. Of course, with time these values have changed, but the relative contributions will more or less remain similar. Okay. So, as you can see over here itself there are some which are the major contributors and as expected it is the heat sink to ambient. Okay. Thermal interface material follows, uh, so does this evaporator uh, thermal resistance and so on and so forth. So, again what I am trying to say is with these measurements they give us an idea as to where to focus. If I have to reduce the overall thermal resistance, what are the bottlenecks and which is, which is the element in this or which is the piece of the pie where I need to attack. Now, let us go into something called flow boiling in micro channels, which is something that has been researched by several groups across the world, many, many papers published and there was also a time when we were looking at it and trying to see how it will work. Okay. So, again this is a I am showing as one micro channel, in reality this will be a, a, an array of channels through which water is flowing and we are looking at flow boiling. So, water enters and when it exits it is water plus steam. So, if that is the case the water and steam mixture has to go to a heat exchanger where it is cooled by air and then the liquid the condensed water has to be pumped back to the micro channel right. We tried out different methods we had some experimental data uh, and we did some modeling with the homogeneous. So, again if you know homogeneous flow boiling regime annular flow boiling regime that is good even if you do not that is ok. Uh, what we are trying to do is using this flow physics of flow boiling trying to come up with predictive models. And what we figured out is especially in micro channels this uh, transition from one phase of boiling to another or one regime of boiling to another it is a little difficult compared to a larger, rather macro channel. Because here itself the characteristic dimension of the micro channel is so small that it sometimes becomes equal to the diameter of a bubble. So, when it when you are bo boiling. Okay. So, we wanted to see how does it work with is it homogeneous is it annular whatever it is. So, homogeneous is when you have vapor in a liquid. Uh, homogeneously dispersed. Annular is when you have an annular film of water and a vapor core. In micro channels what, what is it? Do, we, do I see such, such a transition from homogeneous to annular or is it annular right from the beginning because the characteristic dimension of the channel is of the same order as that of the vapor bubble diameter. Anyway, so we figured out that between homogeneous and annular is where most of the data lie. Okay. So, we said okay, I'm, I cannot pinpoint that this is the model. But if I do, I can say that these are the ranges or bounds. Okay. We also looked at micro pin fin cold plates, where instead of channels, now what 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 is it? If we have micro pins, uh, this is work out of Chandler. Ravi Parashar was my uh, he was my mentor and senior. This is the work that we did at some point, and what we did was we tried to characterize this flow and so on. So I'm not getting into the details of the results, they are there in these papers if you are interested, but what I am trying to show is give you a flavor of the different technologies that have been tried out. And the results were very good in terms of heat transfer they were very good. Now, the question is why is it not in, it is, it is not in, uh, in commercial production today and most likely it will never be. Uh, why is the question. So, this is what we learned the hard way. Now, I, I started with this slide and was trying that this is the biggest what is the biggest contributor and so on, but at that time we also got carried away we tried a lot of things and we, we were successful. We wanted to 
replace this conventional heat pipe solution by a micro channel solution and in essentially what we were trying to do is micro channels would be etched directly on the silicon. So, we were getting rid of the first level of interface uh, no sorry this was no I am sorry this was not directly etched is also possible, but this we were trying in a cold plate. And what we were trying to do is we were getting rid of these two resistances the evaporate and adiabatic resistance by the micro channel. Okay. And what we figured out was the adiabatic plus evaporator was 0.23 degrees per watt degree C per watt micro channel was 0 0.05 it was a 75 percent reduction. Okay. But what about the total 1.5 became 1.37. Okay. So, right at the cold plate level yeah I would say I have got made it 75 percent better, but if you take the entire system it was less than 10 percent improvement and 10 percent improvement at what cost something that is so well established and mature as heat pipe and I want to replace that with something uh, and I have only characterized the channel part I have no clue what pump to use uh, that can handle those flow rates and pressure drops. I do not know what about leakage and so on and so forth okay. and the pump will also need some electrical power to run. So, it was really not worth it, it is not worth the investment all this for a less than 10 percent improvement. So, this case study I am trying to show again is to emphasize the fact that it is very important to know where the actual problem where is the bottleneck and that and that is what what is the biggest problem and to um, focus our attention there. There is this it, it, they also talk about this 80 20 rule that if you have a problem and you do a root cause um, and you solve 20 percent of the problem or 20 percent of the if you address 20 percent of the root the whatever the root cause if, if you list them down 80 percent of the problem is due to 20 percent of the 80 percent of the what should I say problem can be attributed to 20 percent of the causes only. Pareto principle, huh? Pareto principle. Pareto principle yeah right. So, that is the 80 20 rule and uh, that is something we have to follow all right. Next one this this came from Berkeley and this is not my work uh, and this is where they were trying to show that instead of micro channels if I have a cold plate and I want two phase flow boiling what is it that we can do. So, they were trying with nano wires okay. So, these nano wires could be directly on the silicon in which case it will be on the die surface itself or it can be on copper in which case it will be on the cold plate surface. In both cases what happens is uh, the maximum heat flux again people with heat transfer background would know this in any boiling the maximum heat flux which can be removed by boiling is called the critical heat flux. So, critical heat flux is a parameter of importance if you are trying to look at boiling as a heat dissipation mechanism. It also shows that if you have water and if you can change the surface property, the property of the surface the wetting properties of the surface from where boiling is happening and you can make it more and more hydrophilic okay, and in which which means that I reduce the contact angle. Okay. So, this is like on silicon it is 40 degrees on silicon dioxide it is 15 degrees with nano wires you have almost perfect wetting it is almost 0 degrees and if you do that traditionally a series of work shows that if you reduce the contact angle your CHF goes up and here we are around 15 degrees which is water on silicon dioxide. If you can now do some nano patterning on the surfaces and reduce it further and go to almost 0 which is here this is a little extrapolation but it is almost 0 then the critical heat flux really goes up and this is experimentally proven also this is just not just pictures or, or these are not extrapolated data this is actual data. Okay. So, this is there in nano letters where it was shown to work again it is not there because you know growing these nano wires the fabrication technique etcetera is complex it's, it takes time to come to high volume manufacturing, but it just shows what is possible this is the advances Maybe one day it will be I do not know. Okay. We have been talking about thermal interface materials quite a bit and probably professor Dasgupta he will talk about physics of failures reliability of these and so on. Um, so, we do a lot of work and we take a lot of we, um, 
pain in coming up with the different materials that can be used as a thermal for in to you know fill the thermal interface reduce the interface resistance. But so we need high performance we need to reduce the thermal resistance. But equally it is also important to have them perform well and perform reliably and why do I say reliably the performance of all these thermal interface materials degrade with time due to different mechanisms. Okay. The grease which is the most commonly used material has this tendency to pump out okay. as it goes through this power and thermal cycles maybe one year later you take your CPU out you will see the entire grease has come to the edge and there is hardly anything in the middle. Okay. Phase change material with time they tend to lose their phase change uh, component. So, if you do a what is called DSC discrete scanning calorimetry you will see that the fraction that you, you lose that material with time. Okay. So, similar then, then due to all these thermomechanical artifacts you also have delamination which uh, Professor Dasgupta has talked about the silicon. So, they, they will not stay perfectly parallel and flat with each other there will be with thermal cycling there will be some bit of bending and it will never be two parallel surfaces. Now, depending on which surface this interface material has affinity for it will delam either from the heat uh, the either from the heat sink surface or from the silicon. Okay. So, we have seen this I mean there was a big program that is there uh, that I was part of and so this is showing this curve is a representative work from one of our papers back in 2007 in IEEE and what we see here is I have removed all the uh, all the materials etcetera. Uh, we are not allowed to disclose what those materials are, but all I can say is this different color uh, denotes various types of phase change materials. This is a family of phase change material grease and gel and you see that this is a power cycling and you see those what is the power cycling uh, protocol that was followed on for 20 minutes off for 20 minutes and after cycles after like 200, 400, 600 cycles you see that how they degrade how the degree C centimeter square per watt which is a thermal resistance degrades with time. So, it is not only enough to have a very low value of thermal resistance at what we call end beginning of life or time 0, it is also equally important to ensure that they retain that performance over time because there will be some degradation, but that should be minimized. Okay. All right. Yes, please. So, you, you explained like uh, the team after uh, after a course of period, uh, you can see the team has expanded and is given a, a yeah. shallow in the middle yeah. and they just move to pump the out. Yeah, that is for uh, grease, typically for grease that we grease, see that. Yeah. Whatever the team has agreed. Uh -huh. So, what my question is, is there is a recommendation from the thermal saying that uh, you need to maintain uh, after cycle of so much and we need to change the grease uh, because we have uh, solution will, will not be continued after couple of years. True, so we do not recommend uh, I do not think they recommend that after so many cycles you have to change or after so many years you have to change etcetera. Of course, if you do it it will be good, but I believe what we try to ensure or what as a thermal engineer we have to ensure is they hold if, if your threshold value is let us say 0.2 then definitely and and the certification criterion is whatever 1000 sec cycles or so. I can readily say that these candidates even though they are very good beginning of life values they are not suitable. So, I am not going to come with that. Okay. So, at Intel ATD definitely they had some specs that end of life which is the other end the, the performance has to be within a certain limit and there was and we used to do a lot of this called accelerated uh, tests accelerated degradation tests. Uh, so, it bake was one power cycling temperature cycling hast which is both humidity and temperature we would put them in ovens take them out measure them again put them back and and then we will use some reliability models many a times statistical ones not always physics based to predict okay, I did a series of tests at 150 degrees I did a series of tests at 125 degrees and my operating temperature average temperature during lifetime will be let us say 75. Then I would Arrhenius for example, Arrhenius type of equation is one type of model which can be used to predict that what will be the uh, performance at 70 degrees if this was if this was to work. Okay. 
So, there are several models that are used I think. Okay. Now, let us talk a little bit about localized cooling within the CPU. Okay. We will go to system later. Electrovetting on dielectric again something pretty much on research phase right now. What it says is since we are talking about wetting angle, what it says is it is possible to change the wetting angle of a liquid on a solid by changing the electrical properties or by changing the electric fields around. Okay. So, if I have a hydrophobic coating on a surface and then I apply a voltage across it, then it is possible to change the wetting angle and make it hydrophilic. Okay. So, as you apply a voltage across it, it can be DC, it can be AC, the as you can see the same bubble now spreads and wets more of the surface, the wetting angle becomes more. Okay. So, this is pretty much what is called electro wetting. So, wetting under electric field or un under the influence of electric field. So, now how can we use it for electronic cooling? So, let us say we have two electrodes side by side and we have a situation where a droplet is resting such that one half or one end of the drop is on one electrode 1 the other end is in electrode 2. And I switch on this electrode and do not say this electrode is while this is grounded then what happens here the wetting angle is high here the wetting angle is low. So, it is no longer a symmetric arrangement along this along the center line. So, now it is possible to show and this is how the contact angle changes as is shown here. Now, it is possible to show if you solve the if you do a force balance that the there is a net balance net force in this forward direction which is going to propel the droplet. Okay. So, this is how it is. Okay. So, the droplet if I look take at the look at the top view there will be a net force in on this side which is going to propel the droplet in that direction. Okay. Now, let us imagine you have a series of electrodes like this let us say these are all my electrodes one after the other I have a droplet here. Now, I sequentially switch them on what will happen my drop is going to just move like this and I can do it at very fast pace because these are very small I am talking about microliters and so on. And so, I can move a droplet around in a controlled path. Now, think of it as your on your silicon die you have some hot spots where, where you have this whether it is a multi core architecture single core architecture dual core whatever it is. I can sense the temperature I can have this I can have this uh, have this droplet move over those hot spots and cool them okay, and move them pretty fast all right, and move them in a and control their movement such that it goes towards that position where the hot spot is if I have some kind of a sensing and feedback mechanism. Okay. So, this is one demonstration uh, from Cheng and Chen university one where they actually showed you see how they have uh, these are this is not a single picture this is snapshots of the of the droplet taken in in time and then superimposed and you can see they moved a droplet in this direction this was the hot spot this is how it started and it is going towards the hot spot clear yeah. okay far from commercialization but again shows what is possible okay what i will do now is now this was incidentally a project uh, there is a lot of work that happens in IIT Kharagpur on this one and Professor Suman Chakravarti my very good friend and now colleague and one of the I think probably the most celebrated thermofluids uh, academician in the country today. He has done work and this is work that actually uh, Intel uh, that, that time I was at Intel we funded IIT Kharagpur and I will show a small video from that project. You see that this is a water droplet as you can see over here and there is a series of electrodes and then they will be sequentially powered on and see what happens to the droplet. In the beginning there is some teaser time I do not know why <laughs> see now it moved. Now, he is asking the <laughs> camera guy to <laughs> shift so that he can switch it on. So, 
So you can see that the droplet is moving. The droplet is moving on the electrodes because they are sequentially powered on. Okay. All right. So this is what it how it continues. So you get the idea. Now they are thinking of remember in the morning when we were discussing heat pipes and Professor Dasgupta asked that is there a limit on the length over which you can uh, you can move the liquid and I said yes of course there is. Now is it possible now heat pipes are passive device it does not need any external uh, power. Now the question is can I use electro wetting in which case of course I have to power on the electrodes and there will be some additional external power that has to be supplied. But is it possible to move the liquid over longer distances by using pumping because of electrical forces or using electro wetting pump the pump the liquid back using electro wetting forces. So this is uh, again professor Vaiba Bahadur mm, he is very bright young professor at UT Austin and uh, my ex colleague at GE. This is an idea he has done some modeling on this uh, I do not think uh, there is any experimental validation or demonstration yet. But again this is, this is a new idea that he has come up with and at least using solving equations and uh, through numerical modeling it seems that it, it can work it can potentially work okay. So I am trying to see how electrovating just from hot spot cooling is also now being trying to make its way to a more system level cooling like in heat pipes okay. The next one at the side level is thermoelectricity we talked briefly about it. You remember we said that it, it is Seebeck and Peltier effect and depending on which is the cause which is the effect you can have a thermoelectric engine by which you can generate power. If you have a temperature difference you can use thermoelectrics to generate power or you can create a temperature difference if you actually allow uh, if, you, if you put a voltage source and force a current to flow through this either way. So our focus over here from cooling point of view is looking at it as a refrigerator. So this is how it is as I said that typically this PN junctions they will all be electric arranged electrically in series and thermally in parallel right. Thermally in parallel because the temperature gradient is across this so P and N are parallel to each other but electrically they are in series because the current flows first flows through N then through P then through N then through P and so on series of them okay. And this schematic shows how it is arranged okay. Now one of the parameters that control that govern the performance of such and such, such a thermoelectric is the Seebeck coefficient which is the voltage delta V over delta T how much voltage you create because of a certain temperature difference across the ends. Sorry. Now if you look at if you solve some of these uh, energy equations etc try to come up with uh, an expression for efficiency or expression for max or COP for a refrigerator you will see that the performance of a thermoelectric generator or cooler depends on something on a parameter called Z which is the Seebeck coefficient squared times electrical conductivity over thermal conductivity. If you work it out it has dimensions of 1 over temperature so therefore that Z times T is a non dimensional parameter. So we have looked at ZT okay. Now this is a problem if I need a material which is high ZT and which will give me high COP high better performance what do I need? I need a material which has high therm electrical conductivity and low thermal conductivity. Unfortunately most real materials we do not have that if one is good the other is also good if one is bad the other is also bad. So what can we do? So this is that Bermuda and then Seebeck coefficient also for semiconductors it is low for metals. Uh, sorry this depending on the carrier concentration uh, it for semiconductors it is high for metals it is low and sigma for metals it is high for semiconductors it is low and somewhere this numerator s square sigma will peak somewhere. And at the same time at this point I also need my thermal conductivity to be very low which many a times we do not get. So that is the problem now what is thermal conductivity if I look at kappa it has contributions from two one is electronic vibrations the other is the lattice vibrations which you also call phonons. Okay. All right. 
and especially when we come to semiconductor insulators it's uh, it's it's more like the lattice vibrations have have a dominant role to play if you look at the history of zt and people started working on thermoelectrics from many years back okay. if you look here the zt around 1950 was between 0.5 and 1 zt around 2000 was also maybe a little better but there was this whatever this uh, this barrier of zt equals to 1 which people were not able to overcome so and in the middle of course there were like maybe thousands of papers thousands of materials tried out something was uh, if you increase sigma scale also goes up so that ratio was never working out to be to our favor then what happened was around 2001 2002 almost parallelly two studies came out okay and these are the two one in nature the other in science and they call it bismuth telluride super lattices now this is also the time when nanotechnology and the nano fabrication techniques were becoming more and more mature and what both these groups independently were able to do is grow these crystals the thin film at at a length scale which would let electrons pass through but block the phonons because mean free path of vibration for phonons is larger than that of electrons so the electrons would pass through phonons would get trapped therefore what happens because phonons are getting trapped the thermal conductivity goes down but electrons can pass so the electrical conductivity remains the same and this is where then both of them were able to sort of break that barrier and and report something like one one report like 2.5 the other reported a 1.75 or so So almost a 50-year barrier was finally broken thanks to nanotechnology and nanofabrication techniques. So once this material was available, and Intel took over and say, how can we use it? Use for hot spot cooling. So you can see this is a local power map. We have spoken about this uh, in the morning. So this is the hot spot that I want to cool. You can make it in really small dimensions now. Can I strategically place a thermoelectric super lattice? at the location of the hot spot okay so this is where choudhury zitesham he is also incidental alumnus of this institute two years junior to me uh, so what we were able to do is or what intel was able to do was they took one of these thermoelectric coolers and put it not on the chip directly because this was already if you have to do that then you have to do it at the fabrication stage we wanted to show it works so it was put on the underside of the heat spreader aligned with the hot spot the location of which was fairly known to us okay and then remember i said that here in thermoelectric or any refrigeration devices refrigeration based devices you are ultimately dissipating more heat than what you are extracting because you are doing additional work so in a thermodynamically limited system this will be difficult but again now recall that these hot spots even though we are always talking about a steady uh, power dissipation it is never steady it, there is there are spikes if you look at your if you do control all delete and look at performance you will see all these spikes right so the idea was that we are going to monitor the temperature and switch on this thermoelectric on demand whenever is it is required and see how much it comes down and once it comes down below a certain threshold we will stop it so we are going to minimize this power requirement as much as possible and use it only when required on demand okay so on demand swing of 7.3 degree centigrade was possible on 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 a die that was already <laughs> in the manufacture state we just took out the spreader and put put something and uh, put put this thermoelectric on the inner surface and this is the kind of cooling that was demonstrated okay and we so this is an example where you know academic research of course contributed to the development of a new material and then the industry took over from there with an intention to actually trans transform this into a practically implementable solution and it is implementable okay it is not there that's that's a different reason that sometimes technological reason sometimes business reasons as to why a technology is not uh, in production but this was a uh, pretty landmark uh, contribution didn't make it to nature it make it to nature nanotechnology okay 
but still nature publishing group. So, first demonstration of a viable chip scale refrigeration technology, chip scale. Okay, continuing on to refrigeration and now I will come back to your can I control ambient temperature. Okay. Refrigeration in notebooks, you have seen a refrigerator, you have seen an air condition, you have seen the size and I am saying I want to put it in a laptop computer. Okay. So, I want to put this inside here. So, what does it have? There is a condenser, there is an evaporator which are primarily heat exchangers and you have a compressor and you have also a expansion device which is okay, which is not a big problem. But finally, the bottleneck is how do I get this compressor into here. Okay. So, this is where this is the key heat exchangers is possible. So, this is where a miniature compressor this is Embraco, Intel worked with Embraco for several years to develop this this is a compressor that is slightly bigger than a double A battery okay. can fit into a not one of these very thin ones, but a 15 inch screen and all at that time was possible. Okay. So, first what we did was we put an actual refrigeration system including this compressor inside a laptop and showed that this works. Okay. And, uh, when this was taken, when this demo demo piece was taken to different companies, um, they had they were not very uh, not very forthcoming. Oh, I'm going to put a refrigerant inside a laptop. What it what if it leaks? What about the environmental issues? All this stuff. Okay. Plus, you are going to move around with it. Then you have a compressor with mechanically moving parts. So some resistance and all valid ones. From a technology point of view, it works. But we also we have also have to think about all these other problems. Okay. So, then what we said was when do we need refrigeration, when we do we really need this high degree of cooling, do I really need it for office applications and net surfing and email and all, probably not. Where it is needed is the high end gaming systems. Okay. Now, the gamers many a times um, when they are running it or even uh, they put it on their docking stations. Okay. So, the idea was can I remove can I move rather not remove, can I move this entire entire refrigeration based cooling system from the laptop into the docking station. Okay, docking station does not move around, even if it leaks over there is no hardly any electronics inside. So, I reduce the risk and what will I do? I will use that refrigeration inside the docking station to cool the ambient air, to chill air and therefore, and then direct it towards the inlet vents of this laptop. Okay. So, therefore, instead of entraining ambient air, it is entraining chilled air. Okay. So, remember Q was rho or rather m dot C p T exhaust minus T inlet. This T inlet is now being reduced or basically is now being reduced from T ambient to something that is lower. Okay, that is the idea. So, this was a special uh, docking station that was uh, that was made custom made of course. So, these have all the port replicators etcetera you place your laptop and everything is fine and then these holes were created and so, the entire refrigeration system including the heat exchange the compressor was inside and then the air which was coming out of the evaporator like in like in AC. In AC what, what do we chill the ambient air and direct it with the use, using a fan into the room, here we were doing it at a lower scale and directing it inside the laptop and then the laptop was placed like this. So, the air is pre chilled. Okay. Yeah, right, correct. So, now with the laptop placed on top. Okay. So, the air that is going through the vents are now all pre chilled sub ambient, sub -ambient substantially pre chilled like 10 degrees or so. Yeah, yeah. So, this, this is just showing what is possible. So, all these have to be taken up and a lot of work will go before it can be commercialized, but this is just showing what is possible. So, Cinebench R10 I think that is a at that time there was it was, it was a well accepted standard. 
uh, render time was 3.03 .03. and here the render time was first of all 2.44 why was it possible because it was possible to overclock the CPU I think the CPU was rated 2.33 it was possible to overclock it to 3 gigahertz without for 2 minutes and 44 seconds without exceeding the temperature okay. So, it is possible this was a special case, but just to show what is uh, what is possible what is viable, but again you you would not use it for your regular office office laptops, but for the large gaming gamers and all they may be interested ok. okay. So, that kind of uh, ok there is one more thing I want to show um, I had a slide set, but I was not sure how much of it is in public domain. So, I I just went to that website and and would like to show you we were talking about very thin heat spreaders in the morning and I told you that there is one of my former professors at Colorado whom professor Dasgupta also knows well professor Y C Lee. So, he is a professor uh, at university of Colorado and he is he also has a company called Kelvin thermal. So, they have come up with this looks like a like a like a sheet metal or basically thin uh, sheet of copper right but this is actually a vapor chamber where actually what what happens in a heat pipe uh, is is going in going through. So, I will this is the flexibility the thickness you can see is 0.25 mm 0.232 it is showing here all right. So, he has used a printed circuit he is very very strong in packaging and therefore, he has used some PCB uh, fabrication techniques to actually make this uh, heat spreader what it has is let me see it has yeah it has some kind of a mesh structure on the inner walls and a vapor core and the mesh structures here tried out a woven mesh this is what he has tried out and whereas these are also possible and this is where he was able to show that these the effective thermal conductivity is 1400 watts per meter kelvin compare that with copper 400 so, three definitely better than 3 times. So, 1000 to 400 is flex this is what is flexible TGP graphite is 400 to 1500 ok and uh, I think here uh, and this is the effective thermal conductivity, but this is also a function of the heat load because it is not really thermal conduction right it is vapor flowing through. So, the more more amount of heat load that you put in you have more vaporization and therefore, better transport of course, given given the, uh, within a certain limit you do not reach the limit where you have vaporized everything and then you have dry <laughs> you have dry out over there. But within that you can see that with input power up to 25 watts he was able to show 1 millimeter thick 20 centimeter by 5 centimeters this is how the thermal resistance is coming down. Copper of course, a solid conductor. So, it is not going to be the thermal resistance is not going to be a function of input power is L over K A whereas, here it is. Okay. So, and it is flexible etcetera all that stuff all the good things are there this is a vapor code in anyway. So, what we are doing is uh, we are trying to see that can we replace this woven mesh by some more simpler structures which can give you as good a performance if not better ok. So, we are trying to bring in the more fundamental uh, thermofluids analysis and my student Ankita is looking at this one. Again trying to show 0.25 millimeters unheard of, but he is doing that ok. All right. Now, what we will do is we will quickly come to some system level technologies ok. Remember we talked about just the CPU is not enough everything else has to be taken into account. So, we need to increase the higher platform power. So, this Q m dot C p delta t what can we do to increase we need to keep the chassis cooler and also other non CPU components all right. So, let us come over here. So, this we have seen rho V rho m C p delta t we have seen this before plus there is some amount of heat dissipation because you know all the screen the keyboard they are all at temperatures higher than that of the ambient. So, there will be some amount of heat loss by natural convection from all these heated surfaces fair enough. So, there is a passive one as well. Now, 
what is the volume flow rate that I am going to get? Remember we talked about I have a fan, I have a system resistance curve and it is the operating point at the intersection point which is going to dictate how much volumetric airflow I am going to get. Okay. So, if I now have to increase this platform power what can I do? Two options one is to move more air, how can I move more air? Either you increase the fan performance or I reduce the system resistance or both. Okay. Increase the fan performance is difficult of course, it is not impossible if you can come up with a quieter more silent fan giving the same flow rate why not. But otherwise the same fan if you just run it at a higher rpm you are going to break the acoustic limit. So, not possible you cannot go from 1 to 2 and 3 to 4 uh, so and, and this one like 1 to 3 no way because I think the trend is opposite we are going thinner. If you have to reduce system resistance I have to make, make the air flow path more uh, you know wider thicker. and thicker. So, that air can flow with lesser resistance that is not possible in fact, the trend is the opposite. So, therefore, what else can we do? We can look at this one and see what is possible increase passive dissipation. Okay. So, this is where what we thought was I have this screen and a large amount of area available at the back. Okay. Can we use that area somehow can we leverage that somehow? Granted that the screen has to be with the display has to be within a certain temperature which is I think around 50 degrees. So, when I can go up to 50 why restrict myself to ambient temperature. So, can we kind of do this? Can we take part of the heat and through the hinge of your laptop take it at the back of the display and spread it out so that it can be now dissipated by natural convection to the ambient. So, this is what we are trying to do. Okay. So, from here what we are trying to do is through the hinge itself we take it to the back of the display and then we put a thin sheet of metal or thin sheet of any conducting material which we are calling the spreader. So, that the heat spreads out like this and get this gets dissipated. Now, depending on what material you are using in the spreader as well as what is the size of your display it was we were able to show that 7 to 15 watts of additional cooling is possible which is not as which is not a small amount because in those days the, the total platform power at the, at the peak was around 60 to 70 watts. So, 7 watts out of that is more than 10 percent 15 watts even better. Okay. So, I do not know why this yellow is coming back again and again sorry okay, now it is black. Okay. Tried out different materials from aluminum to copper to graphite and several other stuff and depending on the materials as we said we were able to show that is as I said 7 to 8 15 watts of additional cooling. This is a non dimensional parameter that we developed not the non dimensional sorry an effectiveness parameter in degree C per watt. Okay. So, finally, we have to choose it is not just the performance alone the weight becomes important we want the laptop to be light. So, if you put copper for example, additional 220 grams okay. aluminum of course, much lighter but lesser performance as well. Graphite yes very light very good, but it very expensive as well. So, cost weight uh, performance all this come into picture and this is where I want to take up Arun's point uh, cost is very very important and most of the thermal technologies or many of the thermal technologies that I have worked on uh, while while at different companies be it GE Intel they finally, did not make it to production primarily because of business reasons most of them. Because by the I mean tec technical reasons of course, many of them fall off, but we know we know that we will not we will stop working on them. But finally, when we show that something is technically successful and we take it to the business so that they can adopt our technologies most of the times it it is either time to market is not it is not right time to market or the cost is too high and there is no not enough bang for the buck. Okay. All right this one chassis cooling laminar wall jets this is yeah because we are talking about the heat spreading hmm. behind the screen uh, this is uh, right now the r and d is going on that uh, i think it did not it was shown 
in one of your Intel developer forums, but I but, uh, thereafter it, it was not taken up. Because your laptops and all that is not like that nowadays. That's no, right. It did not make it. It did not. Uh, present, present laptops are not. No, I don't think there was a design win from this. It was shown. It was. No, basically in the market itself, huh. you can't do it. We can do it, but they decided not to. They, they thought this no, was not worth it. Now, uh, what are the trend of the laptops? Is uh, it is like a tablet? Oh yeah, yeah. If if you two in one, if you want to take off the screen, yes, no, not possible. The, whole, whole screen no. the small ones, yes, not possible. Yeah. The eleven point six ones. No, everything okay. nowadays. Uh, oh, all, uh, all of them are. Yeah, now the thirteen inch also it came as a two tablet. Two in one. Okay. Ah, then then so okay. <laughs> So then the, the business guys didn't get it right. They thought this was not the time, right time to market. But <laughs> if, yeah, if at all that, that point that's is correct. It's right, uh, right time to market. It's yeah. So at that time probably it was right, but they did not do it, and now they have lost the opportunity. <laughs> okay. Okay. Chassis cooling. Mm, so this one, this is called laminar wall jets, and trying to cool the outer skins. And this technology was actually borrowed from gas turbines. If you look at the gas turbine blades, which um, in the turbine side. Which sometimes look at the, there are these inner cooling passages through which there is which is called a secondary air flow, where some of the inlet air from the compressor after compression, instead of going to the combustor, is now fed directly along the secondary path into the turbine. The rest of it, which is known as the hot gas path or the primary flow path, primary gas path, goes into the combustor where it is where it is burnt and then the hot um, hot gases come into the turbines where it is expanded and which is where we get power. Okay. So, the hot gases are at a much higher temperature compared to what these turbine blades can withstand, they will melt. Okay. But then we have these hot gases flowing over these turbine blades. So, what can we do? Right. So, one of the things there are several technologies and one of them is called film cooling where this cold air which was taken from the secondary path and went into the inner passages, cooling passages now come out through small openings and as they come out they kind of cling to the surface. Okay. So, if I draw something like this, let us say this is my outer wall of the turbine blade. So, so the cold gases actually the come out and then they form a kind of blanket on top of this and prevent it and therefore it protects these walls from the hot gas which is flowing outside. Okay. So, this is film cooling from the gas turbine industry. Now, why does it work? It works because the pressure inside in the internal cooling passage is higher than that of the outside and that is why when you have a hole the air will flow out from in inside out inside out instead of the other way. Okay. And of course, this air has a high momentum and it clings to the surface because you have hot gases flowing above at a high velocity, which is going to push this cooling air next to the wall. Okay. Now, think of the laptop. The pressure inside is lower than that of the ambient. Okay. So, if I put a hole here, the natural tendency is for the cooling air ambient air to come in, except that this pressure difference is not high enough for it to cling to the surface. So, therefore, we can design a kind of a louver to guide the flow and flow right next and form this blanket of cold air on the inner surface of the chassis and thereby protect it from the more hot air which lies above. So, this was the point. It is going to last for a few millimeters after that it will all disperse off, but if I can strategically place this louvered vents at, at, at the locations where hot spots are expected to be present, then I can cool them down. So, you see this is a smoke visualization technology, uh, smoke visualization demonstration of this technology, where you see that the outside's air, uh, we held a smoke gun and you see how it clings to the surface and this is some thermal modeling of that on in ice pack. This is an experimental demonstration, it was a memory door, this is without laminar wall jets, this is with laminar wall jets and a cooling of more than 5 degrees was shown. Okay. Okay. And this was a big hit. Uh, so big hit because okay, this was this was first of all it was addressing a valid problem. Secondly, this was literally no cost. 
because you just do a little bit of tooling at the bottom chassis which you will do anyway for any new laptop model and that is it <laughs> then it works. So, it got a lot of press and all and but uh, what was most satisfying was Acer in the timeline series actually put this on the palm rest on a sticker you can see laminar wall jets skin cooling Intel. Okay. So, that was very do you remember this <laughs> So, it was one of my uh, I was Intel was very kind to me I got a lot of appreciation for this. Jets are jets are going in, yeah. in. And so when you now put it, it, it's, it forms this blanket of cold air on the inner surface of the bottom chassis. Okay. All right. The next one is called synthetic jets. We talked about fans, right? The fans can be. Uh, you, you saw some large ones. People have also made very small fans like these okay, for localized cooling, etc. Okay. The next one is can we look at some other alternate air moving devices that is what we call them. So, this is synthetic jets. What is a synthetic jet? There is a diaphragm inside a plenum with a hole or orifice as you can see. As the diaphragm moves up and down it entrains air during the downward stroke okay. and when it entrains it entrains from everywhere and then when it moves up sorry it pushes it out in the form of a jet. Okay. Now, imagine this happening repeatedly sorry it is going to give out puffs of air like this. This is called a synthetic jet it is just the way we breathe. Okay. When now, what you see the mass flow is mass flow in is equal to mass flow out, but momentum fl momentum in, in the vertical direction in the, the way it is shown here is not in not balanced because when you are entering you are entering from everywhere when you are exhaling or when you are basically throwing it out you are throwing it out in the form of a directed jet. Now, this jet you can now direct on the hot spot you want to cool and get some localized enhancement in heat transfer. Okay. So, this is what synthetic jets are. So, this is an experimental setup where we took a heater array there was already some mean flow and then we put a synthetic jet. By the way synthetic jets also you will find a lot of papers in academia or coming out of academia or various research labs. Most of the times the comparison is when between synthetic jet off and synthetic jet on which is also fair comparison no doubt. But in this case in our case we already have some air flow inside on top of that if we put synthetic jets does it give us advantage that is the that is the question. So, we are able to show this is by the way this is not numerical simulations this is actually PIV particle image velocimetry studies experimental results. You see this uh, so the flow the mean flow was in, in the vertically upward direction as shown in this picture the synthetic jet was coming 90 degrees to it and you can see that you and this is percentage temperature reduction minus 20 percent. So, you can see that there is a large area where the temperature actually went down. So, you can strategically place this jet at the place where you want to cool and cool that. It is also important to note that there are some areas where this is positive where the temperature actually went up because the mean flow because of the pressure pressure contours now gets diverted towards the towards the jet. So, there are certain areas where which is now getting less flow than it would have otherwise. But that is okay, those are not the hot spots, I do not care. And uh, how do you get that? Just like a fan or like smaller than that? Good question. You can devise it, you can design it in various methods. So, now let me show you something that actually this is not my work, this is from G GE. They will show you a video, they call it dual cooling jets, and they were using it for LED cooling for the lighting business and so on, and also for flow control. Synthetic jets, you can use it for cooling, you can also use it for flow control. Okay. So, this is I do not know the audio is not visible this is Peter uh, this is how it looks it has two such diaphragms on both sides and you have to apply an AC voltage across it by the way I forgot to mention that you actuate it by applying an AC voltage at a certain frequency. So, the exact same mechanism as as breathing. See, he was Syed was trying to use it for flow control over aircraft wings for the aviation business. This is what is shown here, and whereas Peter was trying to use it for cooling. The parts of the aircraft and engine. 
A dual PSO cooling jet is two metal discs with PSO elements on either side of it. By actuating the PSO with an AC signal, the device can actually pump like a bellows pump. When you do that at a very high rate, say a couple hundred hertz, you get a very nice net airflow produced by this device by pulling in the air from the surroundings, expelling it at high velocity through the center. And there are different tricks you can do to make it smaller, larger. So various concepts can come in various can be sizes or and shape, as you can see. Your the thickness here is one mm, but when it sort of flares up, it goes to three. Okay. Jets. So here you see just put frame. this is a heat sink to a thermal infrared with a series of these jets at the bottom and now it is and hot, it is almost red hot and white hot. Down to, uh, around 40 C. When each dual cool jet is turned on, now the jets are switched on. air flows from the orifice and will blow up through the fins to the surrounding air, thus cooling the internal electronics of the jets. Blue. Almost immediately. As engineers we like to try new things, so we actually this is bought they're trying to put the wet, trying to put it inside a thin foam for the laptop. And replace replacing the fan inside this device with the dual PSU cooling jet. Actually it was a perfect fit, there was in the XY dimension a lot of space available to put the jet in. In the Z dimension we actually had a lot of space left All over. Right, I think the rest is because the dual cool jet is such a thin solution, there's a lot of space left over Flores that were there, allows the this laptop to become thinner if necessary, was or that space could be taken up with other electronics. It's the first laptop in the world that's cooled by a dual PSU cooling jet. Thin is the new fast. Increasingly today, manufacturers are looking to differentiate their products based iPhones on the form and factor and how their customers are using the computing versus how much. All right, I think that's what we wanted to show. Uh, this is pretty much shows you the technology. Okay. The next one, is PSO fans. We have all seen uh, when we feel co feel hot on a summer day, we take a piece of paper and do this. All right. It cools us down. Okay. Can I do the same for a hot component and automate this flapping motion? So you take a piece of any, any metallic or plastic blade, put a PSO patch and excite it with an AC signal. One half of the cycle it will expand, move down, other half it will move up, contract and move up. Do this, this is what is shown here. Okay. So this was for, for laptops, we were trying it for localized cooling of memories. One of my colleagues at Intel, uh, Yuan Saochik was trying it for heat sinks for desktops, trying to move, replace that fan that sits on top with what, is, what he called a rake piezo, single piezo crystal and then like the teeth of a comb, you would have multiple of these going into the space between two adjacent fins in the heat sink and do this like sweeping motion. Two advantages, one is cooling definitely, which a fan will also do, probably at a lesser noise. The second is there is no possibility of dust accumulation because you are constantly cleaning these passages. Okay. All right. The last one, alternate air movers, is ionic wind. Sorry. Yeah. So what's the orientation of the plane now? Uh, it's parallel to the fin. This was held at an. It can no parallel to the fin. Uh, no, it's normal to the fin. Normal to the fin. Hmm. So it's very long fin. Yeah. So let me see if I can <laughs> zoom it out. So these are the All blades that go in. Okay. okay. And then we were also trying out. I mean, can we? So this height is a little bit. Uh, you see, this height is. Uh, <laughs> so those are blades between the grooves and in between the fins. The fins goes in between the, in these grooves between the two edges and teeth of the piezo fan. Okay. Okay. So this was a, a collaboration with Purdue University and uh, trying to see move air again in a solid state manner, no moving parts, nothing. And the synthetic jet piezo fans also has some movement here. So what is happening is if you have a surface and then you have two electrodes, one is cathode, the other is anode and the cathode has very sharp edges. So this is also called corona wind, I think some of you may have known this. If you now put a very high voltage across this, what happens is beyond a certain threshold voltage, this one will emit electrons. Okay. Now these electrons will have a tendency to move towards the anode. Now as it moves and this is a little counterintuitive, but this is how it happens, it bombards against the air molecules and knocks off the outer electrons. Okay. So what happens is you have more number of electrons and you have positively charged ionized air, air molecules. 
Now, the electrons have very low mass, but the ionized air molecules have much higher mass. So, therefore, now because these are ionized molecules are positively charged, they would move towards the cathode, the electrons would move towards the anode, both the ones that were emitted and the ones that were knocked off. And when they move towards the cathode, now that because they are heavier, they will bombard against the neutral air molecules as well and move them and, and, and propel them forward. Okay. So, this is how we are getting what is called an ionic wind DC corona wind okay. is the overall field is called electro hydrodynamics okay. both DC and AC both are possible. So, I will just play this anim animation once more without any commentary. So, I am giving rise to localized air flow without having fan blades anything. Sir, this knocking off of uh, electrons happens at very high voltage, is it possible? Because Good question, why is it not there? Yes. So, the best we could get was 5 kilo volts, which was no way possible inside a laptop. Okay. So, this again showed, but there have been more advances now. If you look at it, there is something called piezo electric transformer, where they are trying to combine the piezo fans and ionic wind. Okay. David Goh from University of Notre Dame, you can look at, at his papers. There you are able to do this at like tens of volts. Okay. Basically, they are amplifying the movement of the piezo, the, the tip of those piezo reeds by using this. Okay. EHD, yeah, mostly EHD. So, what happens is for the heat transfer engineers, you know that what I am doing is by having this higher current, I am changing the slope the d u d y goes down therefore, heat transfer coefficient will because I have a higher velocity gradient my temperature uh, by heat transfer coefficient will also go up. So, here you can see that this was a bulk flow bulk flow plus ionic wind the reduction was substantial like 45 to 50 degrees it came down to 35 or so. Okay. so this was a collaboration with Purdue University. Okay. So, anyway I think I have I am already past 4 o'clock. And what I wanted to do in this hour was to give you a flavor of some of the more recent technological advancements that have been done in the field of electronic cooling more in more related to the computing sector. And uh, not all of them I think very few of them have made it to the commercial adoption commerci commercialization stage, uh, but nevertheless it shows that what is possible and there is still a lot of room <laughs> where we can innovate and address some of these challenges. Okay. Yeah, there are uh, especially with flows itself, there are quite a few that are happening mm. with the droplet movement quite a bit, liquid metal is one. Even if you come to the more mundane side, if you look at this all in one desktop computers using chimney effect and getting rid of fans completely, uh, that is their passive cooled A AIUs. Um, Golak, who is sitting at the back, we are looking at something called elect AC electrothermal flows. Uh, that is that is very nascent stage I would say, but again so we are always looking at <laughs> uh, looking at newer technologies. Okay. And the other thing that is happening is also a lot of power and thermal management, because none of these are this powering yeah, you guys know it much better than me that the CPUs are always powered in a dynamic state. We were all talking about steady state solutions, that you can always play around with the fact that it takes some time to reach the steady state temperature. So, I can always complete a task by overclocking my CPU for a shorter period of time and by the time you reach the threshold I have done my work. Okay. It is like a bathtub you have a tap open and a drain pipe at the and the drain at the bottom. If the amount by which you can remove the water is equal to the flow in the faucet then the water level remains the same. But at the beginning the amount the water that is drained is much lesser. So, I can and, and that level is slowly rising up. So, I can keep my tap and increase the flow rate uh, to a much larger value and still not reach the level. So, the water level in the bathtub equivalent is temperature here, the faucet flow is the heat generation and the drain pipe is the heat dissipation. Okay. All right, thank you very much that brings yeah, yeah, yeah sure. So, uh, 
We are at uh, level two, if you remember. We talked a lot about level one in days one and two. They're level zero and level one in days one and two. Uh, now we are up at second level. So back to our old hierarchy uh, chart, just to put it in context. So we've been through some stuff on the wafer. We've been through quite a bit of level one packaging. Now we're gonna start talking about this level level two, so at the level two, what we're interested in is the printed wiring board, the interconnects, solder joints, and typically that's also the level where people talk about passives and other components like relays and switches and uh, uh, onboard connector sockets and so on. We won't have time for that much, but I certainly want to talk about the printed wiring board, okay? So that's what we'll talk about in this session. Uh, we'll talk about what does the printed wiring board look like today and uh, how is it manufactured and, uh, and then we'll get on to the assembly, which is solder joints. There may not be time today, we'll see, if uh, that'll bleed into uh, Monday if, if, if we don't finish today. Okay, so that's, I'm not sure if I have it mounted right. That's uh, a typical printed circuit board. Goes by many acronyms. Some people call it printed wiring board, printed circuit board, circuit card assembly, printed wiring assembly. So generally people mean the same thing uh, or various versions of the same thing. And obviously that's basically all it provides is a platform to mount your components. Uh, uh, that's where all your interconnections are. Is the volume too high? Uh, it's a feedback. It's a feedback. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so that's also all the wiring, all the connect, uh, uh, conductors from chip to chip, component to component, to connectors and so on. And uh, uh, the last one is not no electrical functionality. That's also just a surface for identification, identif identifying components, connectors and so on. So uh, we'll spend a little bit more time in one or two slides later on talking about uh, what this internal structure looks like. Gets a little complicated, as you can see, it's multi-layered, and we'll uh, build, up, build those layers up layer by layer, and we'll talk about it, what, then what is all this stuff going in thickness direction. Uh, it's not new to any of you, but for some of the students it might be, we'll talk about all that. So the point is that we have to be able to have conductors going along the surface of the board, and in multi-layered boards we have to be able to go through the thickness because different layers have to talk to each other. Now, on the one hand, we call that level two stuff, but in today's world, it's also in level one, right? So your BGA, your PBGA substrates are just circuit card assemblies. So it's uh, the same technology is also being used in level one. So uh, let's uh, get started here. The simplest boards, the cheapest, simplest boards, and a lot of your automotive electronics are in this category. They're single-sided, single-layered, single-sided board. Components go only on one side. Uh, uh, there are a lot of through-hole components on these also, but the through-holes are not plated. If you see over here, the through-holes are all plated. But in these very cheap single-sided boards, uh, through-holes are not plated. They're, and I'll sketch, well, maybe I can sketch here. So what would a through-hole joint look like if there's no plating? If there is plating, then a through-hole joint will look like this. So this is a drilled hole in a printed circuit board. So uh, let's go back to this picture. Think about, I'm trying to draw that via over there. In this case, we can call that a plated through hole. So obvious terminology, uh, through hole, and then it's copper plated. That's what I'm drawing here. This is the copper. So if you have a component whose leads are going through the, so it's an insertion mount component, leads are going through the hole, and then when you solder it in place, the solder will look something like this. That's, that's what the solder is going to look like. Okay. On the other hand, for these uh, single-sided boards, the, which are very cheap, the, there is no, so there's a hole still, there's a hole in, the, uh, in this substrate material, and we'll talk about what the substrate material is uh, soon, but there's no plating. So there's a pad on this side, copper pad on this side, but there's no plating inside. So now if you put a through hole component over there, insertion mount component over there, the solder joint basically is just on the pad, okay? Sorry, I need to be other side. Other, other, other side. 
Oh, the, uh, the pad needs to be <laughs> on the other side. Sorry, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hold on. So, the, so if the pad is, j as shown over here, if the copper is on this side, then the component has to come from the other side. And the joint will basically be this way. So clearly this is not as robust a joint as this one is. And for low uh, cost applications, that's OK. But for more high rel, uh, harsh environment applications, we have to go to the plated holes. So for that, you require double sided, at least double layered, double sided uh, uh, PWBs. And there the holes, the drilled holes are plated all the way through, typically. And insertion mount components are inserted into those plated through holes. And SMT components, surface mount components, would still sit on copper pads that are on the surface. For that, you would pattern the pads out of this copper that's on the surfaces, and you would uh, uh, mount the components on those pads. Uh, surface mount components, of course, can go on both sides of the board. You can have double-sided boards. That's why we moved to surface mount, so that you can now have double-sided boards with insertion mount. You wouldn't be able to do that, that go on one side. Uh, and then you build up from there. You can have multi-layered boards. So now you can see there are multiple layers. So there are two cores. So think about this. This is the base building unit. The core with copper on two sides. Core with copper. Now, what is a core? We'll talk about all that in a minute. But this core material with copper on two sides is the building block, separated by these pre-preg uh, pre layers. Again, what are pre-preg layers? We'll talk about all that. And then there's copper finished off in the top and bottom. So Typically, multi-layered boards, most of them are about four to six or maybe eight layers, except for niche applications. People use all the way up to about 24, 28, even 32 layer boards for specialty applications. Okay. But those are pretty expensive for very special applications. Okay, so uh, a few, let's get some terminology out of the way. Uh, I've been already using some of those ter uh, terms, so let's just uh, put some pictures to those names. So here is a basic building block. Here's your core. Okay, that's the core, the, the yellow portion over here. So this dark gray is the core. Uh, you've got uh, copper planes on both sides. Some of those could be ground planes or power planes. Then you have signal layers. Okay, uh, you can see on the top there's a solder mask. We'll talk about all of that as we go along. Okay, and then there's metallization on those top layers. Uh, of course, when you build up multiple layers, you can have more layers on top of that. So there can be copper tra traces, signal traces, and buried layers also. We'll get to those. Uh, and then uh, you have the bond pads. Okay, you have bond pads. That's the, uh, the components will sit on top of those bond pads. And then if you want metallization, the signal traces on this side to be able to communicate with the other side or with the ground planes or power planes, then you make these drilled through holes and played, not necessarily through, drilled down to the right plane of interest and then plated so you have interconnection through in the thickness direction. So those uh, through thickness uh, interconnectors are called vias. If they're all the way through, they're also called a pl uh, plated through hole and they're plated, then they'll be called a plated through hole. The acronym for that is PTH, plated through hole for these kinds of uh, plated holes that go all the way through the board. Okay? So in this particular example, that's all the way through, through hole. Uh, but there are, we'll see soon there are many that are not all the way, they're only partially through. So uh, those are called either blind vias or buried vias, depending on where they are in the circuit card, we'll, we'll talk about all that. So that's all terminology that uh, we need to be familiar with or we'll be using now. And then uh, Anand talked, Anandrup talked about thermal vias, and even I'd alluded to that earlier. Those are not really used for electrical interconnection, those are more for thermal interconnection conducting heat from one side of the board to the other so that you can have a heat sink on component on one side, heat sink on the other side. The heat has to get through the thickness of the board, then you use the thermal vias. And thermal vias are typically filled with some conducting metal, so it makes it easier to conduct all that heat down. Okay. Um, and then the conductive pattern is just the uh, conductors that are, uh, that are uh, fabricated on the surface. Again, how do you s fabricate those? Typically, those are etching processes, subtractive etching processes. We'll talk about some of that. The panel is basi basically the circuit cards are made in big square panels on large uh, circuit card materials. 
and uh, then eventually after the circuits are made, they are singulated into individual uh, circuit cards. The land or pad, that term is being used in multiple ways, uh, either for the bond pads on top of which components are going to sit, component leads are going to sit, or also the copper on top of the uh, drilled holes, that region is also sometimes called a pad. Okay. Okay, the pitch is basically for, uh, uh, so if you are talking about circuitry that you can put down on a circuit card, there's a limit to how close you can make it depending on what technologies you're using. So the pitch typically refers to, for that technology, how close can you make your uh, traces on the circuit card. Uh, aspect ratio, the t that term is usually used in the context of these drilled holes. And uh, there's a limit to what's the ma maximum ratio of depth to diameter you can produce. That has to do with the drilling process that you're using. It could be a mechanical drill, it could be a laser drill. Uh, but there are limits to what aspect ratio you can produce, both in terms of drilling and in the terms of plating. So if the diameter is very small compared to the depth, you cannot get a uniform plating through the thickness. So there are limits to the aspect ratio. And uh, so, that, uh, so every time I say aspect ratio, I'm usually referring to the dr uh, drilled holes over the drilled and plated holes. Uh, the term wiring density sometimes gets used. I won't use, the, uh, use it a lot today, but it basically means what's the total amount of wiring length in a given area, uh, typically a centimeter squared. So how many centimeters of wiring in a centimeter squared? That's typical way how wiring density gets expressed. Uh, these are some typical dimensions. Things have gotten a lot smaller than that, so these are just typical values. Uh, about 0.08 millimeters is the uh, with trace widths via diameters down to about 0.025 millimeters, that's about one mil. So uh, those are laser drilled micro vias, okay? So we'll talk about micro vias pretty soon. Okay, uh, so here is a more complete rendition of a cross section like that, uh, just so we can see some of this terminology. So uh, this particular unit is one, two, three inner cores, okay, with their, each one with their copper planes on either side. Some of the copper has been etched away because you're making uh, electrical traces over there, electrical patterns over there. And then you can see the solder mask on this side, on the top, the green layer is solder mask. So the purpose of the solder mask we'll talk about later is, so if I want to make a solder joint on top of that, I don't want the solder to migrate, so you uh, act like a dam. Plus it gives a lot of environmental protection to the materials over there on the surface. So here is an example of a through hole, a plated through hole. So here is copper plated through hole. And uh, then on top of that through hole, there's been uh, plating. So, so there the, there's a pad on top of the plated through hole. And then the, this is what we call the barrel of the plated through hole. And then uh, the pads are where you're going to solder different materials. So typically, you have, we uh, cover that up with some solderable material, tin, le uh, solder, different materials. This would be an example of a blind via. So it's drilled partway. That means this signal layer t needs to talk to this signal layer. Uh, so there's just this hole goes through just one layer. So that's a blind via as opposed to a through via here. And then they're buried via. So in the, uh, look at this one. This layer needs to talk to this layer. So it just goes through one inner layer over there. So that would be a buried via. So buried via, blind via, and through via. Those are the three kinds of via. And then there are uh, the uh, various uh, uh, conducting layers uh, in there will be a power plane where the power supply is coming from, the ground plane, uh, various signal planes where all the traces are, conductors are, okay? So, uh, and then on the surface you've got all the pads for mounting your components on, for surface mount, typically it'll be double-sided, so there'll be components both on the top side and bottom side. So that's the overall structure. Question is, what are each of these materials made of? What's that typical fabrication sequence? That's what we're interested in. And, and at the end of the day, what are the resulting uh, risks of failure, vulnerabilities? Okay, so that's really where we're going with all of this. Okay, um, so what are, what are some of the, uh, from a design perspective, what are you looking for? Notice cost is now on the top, no longer on the bottom. I moved it overnight. <laughs> I'm kidding. It was in the top. Uh, obviously, it's uh, performing multiple functions, electrical functions, mechanical functions, 
and some other miscellaneous physical functions. We'll talk about all of them. So uh, on the electrical side, it has to uh, prevent electrical uh, signals traveling except along conductors. So it must have the right dielectric properties, the right insulation resistance, okay? Uh, both surface insulation resistance and volumetric insulation resistance. So if the surface insulation resistance is small, as an example, too small, not large enough, and that could happen because you have contaminants, okay? Either contaminants that have come from the materials themselves or from the uh, process chemicals or from the environment. So if there's excessive contamination on the surface, then you'll have the, the surface insulation resistance starts to degrade. Then you have leakage currents between neighboring traces, and that's not good. You want the signals to go along the traces, not across traces where they're not intended to go. Right? So that's why the insulation resistances are important. And that's one of the normal failure modes in circuit cards in harsh and dirty environments is slow loss of surface insulation resistance. Uh, high dielectric strength, okay, so they have to, they're, but they're operating as, dial they're functioning as dielectrics, so they have to have the sufficient dielectric strength. They, sh they should not suffer dielectric breakdowns. And again, we'll talk about how they do break down. Uh, uh, there are known failure modes for these dielectrics, and uh, we'll talk about those. Most of those involve uh, electrochemical migration, metal migrating from one end of the dielectric to another where they're not supposed to. Okay, uh, then the dielectric constants and the loss factors are usually tailored. So if this is a high frequency board, then there these properties are extremely important, the loss factors, dielectric constants. So they have to be tuned based on what the circuit performance, uh, so, uh, circuit goals are. So circuit designers will spend a lot of time tuning these dielectric properties. On the mechanical side, which is more my domain, uh, the circuit cards have to, uh, they see a fair amount of bending, by the way. That's why you're seeing the term flexure over there. Uh, they see bending in uh, f during the manufacturing process. Components are being inserted. They're being f put into fixtures for soldering purposes and so on. So a fair amount of handling and bending, it has to survive all of that. Uh, also, when you have, uh, we talked about this yesterday in uh, level one packaging, same thing happens in level two. If I have large components that are stiff, large components that are soldered onto uh, circuit cards and they are asymmetric, then they may actually warp the entire circuit card, okay, depending on the CTE of this component and the CTE of the circuit card, they may actually warp the entire circuit card. So depending on your application, you have to make sure your circuit card has sufficient flexural rigidity and flexural strength. Uh, for thick multi-layered circuit cards, that's usually not a problem. They're stiff enough in bending, but sometimes we use very slender circuit cards. Uh, uh, for example, in your cell phones, you have very, very thin circuit cards. Those are uh, the flexural, flexural rigidity is not very high, so you have to make sure they're mounted correctly so they're not bending excessively. Okay, uh, modulus of elasticity, that's, uh, well, the flexural, the bending also is a function of the modulus of elasticity, but the modulus of elasticity plays many other roles, uh, both the in-plane modulus of elasticity and the out-of-plane uh, modulus of elasticity, both are important. And we'll, as we'll see soon, these are highly anisotropic materials because they are uh, composites. They are fabric reinforced composites. So composites are not isotropic. That means their properties are not the same in all direction. So the in-plane stiffness is typically much, much higher than the out-of-plane stiffness. And conversely, the in-plane CTE is much, much lower than the out-of-plane CTE. Uh, all of those have uh, consequences, dangerous consequences on your reliability. The in-plane stiffness and in-plane CT drives the uh, uh, mismatch stresses in solder joints. So uh, the in-plane CT causes mismatch with component CT, and that drives solder joint failures. The out-of-plane CT drives the th uh, thermomechanical stresses in the plating in the vias, and that fails plated through holes in vias after many cycles of uh, power cycling or thermal cycling the VS fail, and we'll talk much more about that later today and again on day five. Uh, so once again, the CTE and the stiffness in both in-plane and out-of-plane directions are super important. Glass transition temperature, again, we talked about this yesterday. Electronics have to 
operate at many different temperatures depending on your application and you've got to, these are usually polymer well these could be ceramic printed circuit boards but today we're talking more of uh, organic printed circuit boards uh, uh, polymer reinforced or uh, well glass reinforced polymer and uh, the moment you say polymer polymers have glass transition temperatures and you better pick a polymer whose glass transition temperature is above your used temperature so we'll look at what are all the various polymers the most common polymer is goes by the name of fr4 that's used for so most of it generic, if you just walk into a shop and buy a circuit card, you probably what you're buying is FR4. And those usually have glass transition temperatures of about 125 degrees C. Can't use them above that temperature. If you want higher temperature boards for high temperature applications, you need specialty polymers, and we'll talk about that as we go through. So bottom line, the, the glass transition temperature is extremely important. Okay. Uh, what happens, what happens to polymers beyond, I and mean, why is the glass transition temperature important? And I'm looking mostly at the students here. I know you guys know the answers. What happens to polymers beyond glass transition temperature? Or what is glass transition temperature? Uh, well, the concept of ductile to brittle transition is really meant for metals. But effectively, you're right. So what happens is if you look at the stiffness of the material, E versus in all polymers, Modulus drops with temperature, so initially it drops slowly. At some temperature, certain temperature, it drops very dramatically and then continues to decay, but at a much, much lower value. Basically, it's lost, at this temperature, it's lost all its stiffness, lost all its uh, mechanical uh, uh, robustness. Conversely, the thermal expansion coefficient is relatively low, relatively low, below glass transition temperature, and v very, very high above glass transition temperature. So this is alpha, CTE, and this is E. Uh, at glass transition temperature, both change dramatically. Why? What happens, what happens to the polymer? What's the physics of what's happening to the polymer at the glass transition temperature? It goes from a semi-crystalline state to a completely glassy state, amorphous glassy state and loses all its stiffness, okay? Okay, um, so uh, there are other properties that are extremely important. Corrosion is important, moisture resistance, because these are polymers, they'll absorb moisture, so that's important. Dr uh, ability to drill through those materials is extremely important. That's manufacturability, because you're drilling these, so either mechanically or through laser, you're drilling holes in them. So not all materials are easily uh, machinable, okay? And then the thermal properties, so uh, thermal conductivity, uh, thermal diffusivity, all of those are extremely important. Okay, uh, so here's what the materials look like typically. So what you basically have is a fabric weave of glass fiber bundles. So uh, these, each of these strips that are woven in and out are actually not a single strip. They're a bundle of hundreds of glass fiber, cylindrical glass fiber. So if I were to cross-section this and look at the ends of one of these bundles, I would see an elliptic uh, bundle like that. And if you zoom into that, you see individual glass fibers. So those little white dots are cross-sections of individual glass fibers. So there are hundreds of glass fibers that make up each of these yarn bundles. And then the yarns are woven in and out in a, what's called a plain weave, a plain weave structure. And then you impregnate all of that with resin. So the surrounding gray area here is resin. So you can see this is a yarn bundle that's in the plane of that picture, or of the screen. This is a yarn bundle that's coming out at you from the plane of that uh, uh, screen. And uh, together, that whole thing makes up this yarn bundle. Okay, so you're kind of taking a cross section here and looking at it from one side. And all the dark gray area is the resin that this is embedded in. That resin is whose glass transition temperature we're interested in. Glass will not uh, get soft at 125 degrees C, but that resin will. Uh, what's the purpose of the glass? It's to control the stiffness, in-plane stiffness, and the in-plane coefficient of thermal expansion. So what controls the stiffness and CTE in the vertical direction? There's no glass in the vertical direction, right? And that's why it's so anisotropic. So as an example, in-plane 
the Young's modulus may be about 17 to 20 GPA because of, these, because of the stiffness of the glass fabric. But out of plane, it'll be barely five, three to five GPA, okay? Uh, same thing with thermal expansion coefficients. Uh, in plane, it may be 17 parts per million, 15 to 20 parts per million per degree C. Out of plane, it could be as much as 45 to 70, 70 parts per million per degree C. So very, very highly anisotropic, which means what the component sees in mechanical terms is very different from what the plated through holes see in mechanical terms. If plated through holes are seeing the vertical properties, these components are seeing the horizontal properties. So they're seeing entirely different mechanical beasts. Okay. Okay. Uh, so what kind of glass and what kind of resins are used typically? Okay. Uh, depends on application. So uh, there are three, uh, well, four kinds of glass. The vast majority of them are e-glass. Okay. Now I'm not going to. We don't have time to get into all the compositions of each of these glasses. But they basically have different levels of additives to change their properties, change the dielectric constants. Uh, the most common one that's usually used is uh, e-glass. Okay? Then there are some high strength uh, glasses like S, but that's more for aerospace kinds of applications. We don't really use them in electronic applications. Okay? Okay. Sometimes we do do that to uh, control the thermal expansion, but that's only in very uh, uh, high temperature expensive applications. So this is a zoom in of one of those yarn bundles. Okay, so if you zoom into one of those yarn bundles, you'll be able to see the individual, the cross sections of individual glass fibers. So you can see some of the glass fibers running in the plane of this screen and some coming out uh, from the plane of the screen. Uh, so coming back, now we are talking about, the, so we just talked about the glass, now let's talk about the resin. And the resin is used not only in, uh, in, uh, within these, fa uh, sorry, to impregnate these fabrics. And that's what these, this core material is made up of. Uh, this whole core is made up of these uh, 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 resin impregnated uh, fabrics. And then on the two sides of it are unreinforced. It means there's no glass here. So these are special layers, and we'll talk later about those, why those are put in. So these are special layers without any glass. And there, there's just pure resin. And then here are some of the vias that we have seen before, so, uh, buried vias on the surface. Uh, sorry, uh, blind via vias on the surface, buried vias here. Notice how some blind vias can, in fact, be stacked. Okay, these are all micro vias, blind micro vias. Sometimes they're stacked to go through multiple layers and so on. Okay, well, let's come back to our topic, which is the resin material, which is either in these layers or in the surface layers. Uh, well, surface layer actually uses some specialty res resins, but mostly in these core layers are uh, this material, FR4. So the most commonly used material is FR4. There are also uh, low cost, remember I talked about single layer, unplated, uh, low cost printed circuit boards. Those use FR1, okay? So uh, single layer, unplated boards. So that's very low cost material, but about 80%, the vast majority of circuit cards use FR4 material uh, that's melt temperature of about, not melt, glass transition temperature of about 125 to 135 degrees C. Uh, you can get higher temperature uh, functionalized, okay, specialty FR4 materials, which goes actually by the name of FR5. Those can be taken up to about 185 degrees C. Those have been specially tailored or specially modified in order to have a higher glass transition temperature. And finally, if you really need high temperature applications, 300 degrees C or so, you cannot use epoxies at all. These are all epoxies, various kinds of epoxies. You cannot use that anymore. You have to go to poly emits. But that's a different class of uh, polymers and um, much more expensive, much harder to uh, machine. Uh, but if you must go to high temperature, then you're out of options. You have to go to uh, poly emit boards. Or you have to go to ceramic boards. OK. Uh, so here are some other examples of resin materials. There are BT uh, uh, materials. There are cyanide ester materials. Here are the polyimids that we just talked about. Cyanide ester is also fairly common. Kevlar, for a while, uh, was being uh, explored. It's very expensive. It's a, it's a DuPont material, okay, extremely expensive. 
but relatively low CTE compared to the others. Look at the CTE of the others. Uh, cyanide, there's one particular cyanide ester with S glass that would give you effectively low CTE. Uh, same with polyamide, okay? But Kevlar was also explored for that same purpose. The CTE is small, so that's getting closer and closer to silicon. So that means uh, if you make a Kevlar board, then the CTE mismatch with components would be fairly limited, so the solder joints would not fail. So that's why people explored some of those for high rail applications, but they're very expensive and very difficult to machine. Worse, the out-of-plane CTE is extremely high, and that was killing the through thickness interconnects in Kevlar boards, okay? So same with all of these. All of the ones that have low CTE in-plane have extremely high CTE out-of-plane, so again, you try to cure one problem, you aggravate another, exacerbate another problem. All right, and then of course the electrical property is important. They're all roughly in that range of about 3.9 to 3.5 3 to 4.5 in that range, roughly. Okay, dielectric constants. Uh, but you can see that the CTs, the mechanical properties, vary quite a bit, and that's why they created these different materials, partly to get different glass transition temperatures. You can see some of the high temperature materials here, and partly to get different CTs for tailoring the board CT to components. Okay, um, so here's what a basic building block looks like. So I keep talking about core and, uh, so core and copper, that is one basic building block. Okay, so again, core and copper, that's one basic building block separated by prepregs. So you can see there are multiple building blocks separated by this green prepreg. So let's look at each of those building blocks more closely. So here's what each building block looks like. It has this FR4 laminate in between. So this laminate is basically multiple layers of these materials. You're looking at a cross section of that laminate. And then on either side of that is bonded copper cladding. And that come, you can buy those as sheets. And that's what you use, uh, stack up, make all your circuitry on this, stack them up, laminate them together to make multi-layer circuit cards. So this is one layer of a circuit card, okay? Uh, so typically called a copper clad laminate, CCL. So this laminate has been fully cured. The prepregs are not. The prepregs are soft materials. They've not, this, sorry. The prepreg materials are only partially cured. They're used to bond everything together, but everything in red, which is the core, is completely cured. That's rigid, that's hard, okay? So, so that's a stiff, hard, fully cured composite laminate, multiple layers of glass fabric with uh, FR4 polymer. And then bonded on top of that is this copper cladding. And then it's our job to make whatever electrical patterns we want on it for circuitry, power planes, signal planes, et cetera. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that is our base building block for multi-layer printed wiring boards. Okay. So the copper that we put on it, there are two kinds of coppers that we put on it. It's either electrodeposited or rolled copper. So you make these copper sheets or foils either by electrodeposited or uh, by rolling process. And they have very different properties. So electrodeposited uh, den uh, density is much lower, higher porosity. Rolled copper is usually much more uh, 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 homogeneous and uh, lower porosity, <coughs> higher density. And the thickness depends on uh, what kind of copper you want to put down, depends on electrical functionality. And it's usually measured, the thickness is measured using a metric that used to be used in the roofing industry in terms of weight per unit area, okay? So we talk about, oh, we want to put down one ounce copper, we want to put down two ounce copper, that's the terminology. And it comes from the old uh, building roofing industry. Uh, if you actually look at the density of copper and convert it from weight per area to thickness, mm -hmm. it works out to roughly about 35 microns thickness for one ounce copper, uh, two ounce copper would be 70 microns thickness, and so on, and then you could have uh, Fractional, fractional ounces, uh, much, much thinner, 12 microns, and so on, okay? Okay, so it's up to a designer to specify uh, what density, uh, what, uh, what thickness copper they want, okay? So for electrodeposition, and uh, we really don't have the time to go through all of the detailed processes, just enough to know for now that there are two different kinds. Uh, some are made through electrodeposition in uh, electroplating baths, okay? 
so you'd basically turn this titanium drum round and round in this copper bath and the copper would slowly crystallize onto that and then you would roll it off of that to, uh, to store it, okay, uh, on a, to spool it. And the uh, thing about electrodeposited copper that we need to know is that its texture is very different from rolled copper. Uh, there are two sides to it. The side that is on the drum is a shiny side. The sh side that is away from the drum is a matte side. And the matte side has this very uh, lumpy look to it because it's being electrodeposited particle by particle. It has that very lumpy look to it. And if you look at the copper, there's a matte side and a shiny side. The shiny side is very smooth. The matte side has this lumpy uh, uh, microstructure to it. Then the rolled copper is actually made from ingots or billets. And the billets are slowly rolled between these rolling wheels or in a rolling mill. Uh, through thinner and thinner and thinner separation until you get it down to the thickness that you want. So if I want one ounce copper, I would go in a rolling mill up until that thickness came down to uh, 35 microns, and then uh, I would spool that. If I wanted two ounce copper, I'd only go through to about 70 microns, spool that. So you would set your rolling mill for whatever thickness copper you want. And uh, then uh, the surface has to be treated because this is what's going to be bonded to the laminate, so you need good adhesion. So usually there's fairly expensive uh, surface treatment that goes on in order to form good adhesion capabilities with the uh, uh, composite, with the laminate, okay? So in general, rolled copper is mechanically far better than the electrodeposited one, because the electrodeposited one has a lot of pores, uh, uh, very crude microstructure. So its mechanical properties are not that uh, as good as that of rolled copper. Rolled copper is generally much more ductile and can survive much higher stresses. So when you make flex printed circuit boards where the copper has to go through large deformations, rigid printed circuit boards, it's okay. But nowadays we make a lot of flexible printed circuit boards uh, have to be made out of rolled copper. You cannot make them out of electrodeposited copper. And then this basically walks you through the process of how the, uh, uh, metallization, uh, how the metallization is patterned. So you start out with these building blocks, copper cladding. Then you would put uh, photoresist on this. You would then develop the photoresist with your mask. We talked about photoresists in level zero, uh, wafer level uh, processing. Uh, and then you would etch away. Uh, as, uh, you would expose it right with the right. Uh, so your, the circuit pattern is on your mask and then you would expose it, then you would develop it with the right chemical that removes the rest of the photoresist, leaves behind uh, only the portion that's been exposed. And then you would etch away the rest of the copper that is still over there, so now you can see. And then you would finally strip away the blue photoresist and now you've got the circuitry that you wanted. So very complex circuit patterns can be made with, uh, with masks like that. Okay, and then ultimately for protection, there's a black oxide coat that's been put down over there. Okay, and then, so, so that's what you would do. You'd make up multiple layers of those circuitry. You can do that on both sides, make circuitry on top, circuitry on bottom. So you'd make multiple layers like that, and then you have to stick them all up together. Okay, so you would stack up various layers together. Uh, uh, and now you can see the prepreg. So on both sides of it, in order to laminate it, you need this prepreg material, which is a semi-cured. Same material, FR4 material, but semi-cured. It's not fully cured. It's kind of tacky. So now you can put them all, stack them all together and cure those prepregs, that's what sticks everything together, glues everything together, and now you've got a full circuit card with circuitry at the bottom layers, and also you can make circuitry on the top foils, that's on the outside of the prepreg, but the same process, and now you've got a fully finished circuit card. That red forces are basically showing uh, the pr pressure you're applying in your lamination step in order to laminate all of that together at high temperature. Okay. So the prepregs are basically the glue uh, as you cure the prepregs, that's what puts everything together. Okay, <clears throat> so th this is repeating that same step in a slightly different picture. So you take your patterned uh, building blocks, right, patterned cores, and then uh, uh, stick the prepregs, that's your glue layer, adhesive layer is the prepreg layer, okay, in between. And then you uh, put the outer, and, uh, outer foils, top and bottom, then take all of that together, align them. They're aligned very carefully. Alignment is extremely critical because the trace, all the uh, pads on this one have to line up with pads on the next one and so on. So they're uh, usually aligned in precision jigs and then you press them all together and put them through a lamination oven and uh, it, uh, the prepreg layers get fully cured and that's how everything gets glued together. 
So, as an example, epoxy uh, prepregs, you would have to cure them uh, during lamination, you'd have to cure them at 185. Polyimids, you would have to cure them at 250 degrees C, and so on. Okay. okay. Um, and then finally, you have to finish. So, these are all. Uh, uh, sorry, so the inner layers have all been done. So as an example, here's a core. Uh, inner layers have already been patterned. And now there's a prepreg. You just made up a laminate. And with that prepreg, you put in these outer foils. Okay, the two outer foils. Now you have to pattern those. So the last step is to go ahead and make the same process. You pattern those. You put down uh, 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 photoresist. You uh, uh, use your artwork for the circuitry that will be on the surface. You make up that circuitry and, and that's basically it. And then you b usually cover up that surface circuitry with some protection. So you would use either tin plating or solder plating or gold plating or uh, uh, OSP, which is just an organic coating. If, uh, OSP stands for organic solder preservative. Okay, so just an organic coating. So there are various types of plating you would put down on the surface layer just to protect it from oxidation in the open environment because later on you're going to solder components on these bolts. If, it, if the surface oxidizes, you cannot solder to them. So you have to preserve the surfaces for solderability. So that's the outer layer process and that, that's pretty much it. So that's what makes circuit cards. Okay. Final step you now have to put down some solder mask on top of the copper. So this is the surface copper that's been patterned. And now you put down the, the green layer, as many of you know, is, is the solder mask. And the purpose of the solder mask is, again, multifold. One, it protects the copper and all the metallization from uh, external environment. Uh, second, the solder mask has openings only where solder uh, you'll be uh, soldering uh, other components down later on. So as an example, if you zoom into this particular circuit card, you see that the green solder mask has holes or openings. So there's a SOIC that's going to go on over here. Okay, so that's those holes, uh, those pads have been left open for the leads of the SOIC to be soldered on. Then resistors will go in here. R17, R18, those are resistors. So these are the pads on which the resistors would get soldered and so on. So the solder mask has these openings and those openings of course are plated with the protection material, solderability protection material I talked about. So it would be tin plated, uh, uh, solder plated, uh, organic plated, etc. cetera. Uh, so the way the solder mask is put down, oh, oh also, uh, well, so the idea is that it now prevents, when you do the soldering, it prevents the solder from going across. It acts as a solder dam, restrict the solder to just the open areas so that it doesn't bridge across neighboring pads and cause shorts, so it prevents solder bridging. It also plays an electrical role in uh, controlling the outer layer impedance. It, it participates in that uh, uh, impedance uh, uh, composite at the layer, so it's part of the electrical design process. It also protects from handling damage, environmental damage, uh, corrosion resistance, and so on. And the kinds of materials that are used, it's either just epoxy that's screen printed on. Remember, I printed, screen printed because I need to leave these holes open, so I need some kind of a stencil printing. Okay? So either silk screen or stencil printed epoxies. So those are liquid epoxies that are printed on this and then cured or they are photoimmigeable, that means photocured, UV cured, so liquid photoimmigeable inks uh, that are silk screened or sprayed and then uh, patterned with uh, uh, photoimaging, patterned to uh, get those uh, metallization windows open and then eventually uh, cured. Or sometimes they're dry film, so dry film is done with vacuum lamination, again the holes are patterned after uh, the material is put down. So those are all photoimmigeable for the purposes of making those openings, etching those openings. And then finally the curing is either uh, uh, UV or, uh, or thermal. Okay, so it's epoxy, uh, it's polymer after all, so it has to be cured, one final cure step. So that's it. That's, that's how then the, finally the solder mask is put on and that completes that, so the solder mask is now on the final o uh, surface layer and that completes the printed wiring board. Uh, this is just showing those steps of uh, uh, your uh, uh, putting down the solder mask. Then uh, wherever the openings are, you are putting down uh, uh, solder as a, uh, as a protection. Okay? So on top of those solder bumps, you now mount your components and so on. So you can see the p component uh, footprints are over there. Okay? 
All right. Uh, oh, there's one final step left, connectors. Your board often has connectors on them. Let's go back here, all the way back to the first picture uh, here. The board often has uh, connectors, so back there, and the connectors usually also have to be plated with uh, connectors need specialty materials. They need soft, noble metal wear, uh, that uh, resists wear and provides good contact. So typically gold is used for that. So uh, that last step is left. So that's what's going on in this slide. So there's a step left where you uh, mask, but just uh, tape away the rest of the surface where you don't want the gold to go. And then you plate, uh, well, first you put down nickel. There has to be a barrier layer of nickel. Otherwise, the copper and the gold would interdiffuse. OK? So you put down a uh, barrier layer, nickel. So nickel plate the fingers. And then on top of that, you gold plate the fingers. And then you strip away that tape, and you're all done. OK? Fin the final operation is just the, uh, cutting the board to the right shape, chamfering the edges, the finishing stages. Uh, we, there's one important step we haven't talked about yet, and that's drilled holes, okay? So the through thickness holes, uh, we'll come to that in a minute. But here's uh, some of the coatings. I talked about the fact that all the copper is covered with different coating materials. Here's a list of what kinds of coatings are used. Uh, sometimes it's tin plated, typically matte tin, about seven and a half to 10 microns. But there has to be a barrier layer underneath, otherwise the tin and the copper would interdiffuse and form intermetallics. So nickel is used as a barrier layer. And over that barrier layer, you can have tin, you can have gold. So various coatings are used. Uh, there's also an electroless ver version of nickel that's used in some configurations. So these are called enic boards. They have electroless nickel as opposed to electroplated. And then immersion gold, very thin immersion gold on top of that. So in this configuration, the gold is very, very thin. So these are 1 micron gold. This is 0.1 micron gold. So the purpose of that is to save on cost. Gold is very expensive, so enoch boards uh, were an effort to make cheaper boards than these regular uh, gold-plated boards. Uh, sometimes instead of gold or tin, we just cover them with solder. So that's called hot air solder leveling, hassle. Okay? So uh, wherever there was copper exposed, you just put down the solder. Or as I mentioned, sometimes you just put an organic layer to protect it. That's called OSP, organic solder preservative. Or sometimes you just use immersion tin or immersion silver. Okay, all of these are industry, various parts of industry use various finishes. Okay, okay uh, skip over that. We've, been, we've uh, done that. And then panelization. So you make multiple circuit cards on single panels and then you separate them out individually. So that's called uh, sing, uh, sing, singulation okay, or, or panelization. Yeah. OK, um, where are the drilled holes? I forgot to put in a slide on drilled holes. So once you've stacked the boards, once you've stacked the boards, well, now before you're stacking, so once you've finished your laminate, for each, for each of these, if there's a buried via, so just a one layer buried via, you would have to drill the hole right there. If it's uh, 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 buried via that has to be through two layers, both the layers have to have the matching holes. If it's a through hole, it's usually done at the end after it's laminated, then you drill all the way through. Okay. Okay. We will talk about a different kind of via. I have slides in micro vias. I forgot to put in slides for these uh, through hole vias. Okay. Okay. All right, let's talk about some specialty aspects of PWBs nowadays. So uh, I talked about the fact that in addition to the regular reinforced layers, there are these specialty layers on the surfaces that don't have any glass fabric in them. This is just polymers, specialty polymers, but just polymers. And these are called surface laminar circuit layers or called built-up layers, and sometimes there are multiple layers of those. What is the purpose of those layers? Well, that's, if you think about it, uh, increasingly, s substrate like these require very fine pitch metallization because the flip chips are going to go directly on it. Well, drilling such small holes with that kind of precision is very, very difficult on glass reinforced, difficult on glass reinforced fabric boards. 
So you can't have the glass fabric. So these are specialty layers where there is no reinforcement material, it's just polymer, and we can get better dimensional control there. So uh, these, and then small vias are drilled, and, and I'll talk soon about how they, they're drilled, very small vias, these are much, much smaller than the vias in the main part of the circuit card. They're called micro vias. And uh, those are made with very small dimensions and very small pitch in order to have the right feature uh, length scales to match with the pitch on the flip chip uh, pads. Okay, so uh, uh, these micro vias, so these layers are built up layer by layer. So you put down one layer, you would build up the patterns, electrical patterns, because this is acting as a redistribution layer to bring the signals from the from the chip or from the flip chips down into the printed circuit card and then out the out into the rest of the circuit card. So these are acting like redistribution layers. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, so these are built up layer by layer. So you put down one layer of polymer, you do all the metallization on it, and you make the vias. And uh, let's talk about that. Those vias are either laser drilled or chemically etched. So let's talk about how those are made. So it's shown here also. The dark ones are standard cores with reinforcements. These light green ones are uh, the surface layers with no reinforcement. And here brown is conventional, blue is surface layer. And these are the micro vias. These are very, very tiny compared to the regular vias. And uh, this is where the connections made to the flip chip joints. Each micro via would match up with the flip chip joint. OK. Uh, so you can see the flip chip doesn't really sit on top of the micro via but with, on a neighboring pad, but that neighboring pad is then connected to a micro via. Okay. So you can see just sort of a visual comparison of what's the typical dimension of a micro via versus a typical dimension of a regular via that's in the circuit card. Okay, So that's a typical through hole via. Uh, these rings around these vias are nothing but pads on intermediate layers. There's a multi-layer board, okay, multi-layer board. So these are pads on each of the layers that uh, look, uh, so those are the copper patterns that are all together here. Okay, okay here's a cross section of through an actual micro via. So you can see there's a pad on this layer, on the lower layer, and then the micro via is formed on top of that pad. Okay, and so the, what you would do is you'd build this layer, you'd do the uh, build the pads, the metallization on that. Then you would spin coat the next layer. You would drill down over there. You'd uh, that you do that with either laser or laser drilling or with chemical uh, uh, etching. Okay. Uh, and then you would plate that to make the micro via. So that's the typical process. Uh, and the idea is to get to very fine pitch, high I.O. count, advanced packages, chip scale packet, BGAs, flip chips, and so on. So basically what you're trying to do is increase the routing density. That's where you you're using those special layers and the micro vias. Okay. okay. Um, so there are basically two ways to make those micro vias. One is laser drilled. Here you're seeing a micro via go through two layers. Sometimes it can go through just one layer, sometimes two layers, sometimes even more than that. Okay. So in this case, it's been laser drilled. You can see what it looks like. And then it gets plated on top of that. So the copper plating is put in after the drilling. You then put down the copper plating. So this is before the copper plating. And this one is different. This is the, here the dielectric is photoimmageable. Uh, so this has been etched away out of a photoimmageable dielectric. So it's been exposed and developed. The photoimmageable dielectric has been exposed and developed. That's how you form the via. And then it's been plated with copper. And uh, that's what the finished via looks like. And then sometimes we even fill these vias with metal. So these, they are filled uh, micro vias. And sometimes they're open micro vias. Okay. Okay. Uh, the original goal when micro vias were made was to make the solder joints directly on them. We no longer do that. Because if you try to make solder joints directly on the vias, typically end up with trapped air and voids, big voids in the solder joints, and that causes a reliability problem. So now the vias are made on pads, next, uh, the solder joints are made on pads next to the vias, and the micro via just gives us the interconnection to the next layer. Okay. okay. Uh, this one I'm going to skip. This is uh, basically picking the material properties of underfills. Uh, remember we talked about all the uh, characteristics of a good underfilled material. It had mechanical properties, electrical properties, thermal properties, thermomechanical properties, moisture absorption. All of those properties were important. Adhesion properties, all of those were important. Add one more to it, 
it has to have good adhesion also to these surface layers that you're talking about, these specialty polymers that you're putting down for surface layer. It has to have good adhesion to that and good CT matching with that, that material also. So that's an additional requirement for underfilled materials. Okay. All right. Uh, so printed circuit boards, this is just a very quick uh, slide here to remind you that printed circuit board materials come from many different parts of the supply chain, just like any other part of the electronics uh, manufacturing. There's no one company that's going to make all the materials I just talked about. Someone is supplying the resins, someone is supplying the glass, someone is supplying the fabric weave, someone else is doing the lamination, uh, someone is supplying the copper, uh, and you're buying from multiple different people. These are basically color coded by different parts of the sectors of the uh, supply chain that these materials are coming from. And you're dealing with people with vastly different uh, skill sets, uh, uh, companies with vastly different skill sets, different specialties. Each one has tunnel vision about what they're doing about their product. It's like going to a medical specialist, right? You talk to your cardiologist, they have no idea what the urologist is telling you. At the end of the day, it's all one body but each doctor has their own advice and oftentimes they're conflicting. It's the same problem over here. The resin guy says, I got the best resin for you. And the copper guy says, that's never going to work with my copper. Okay, so it's a big problem. I mean, it's, the reason I put that up is because we deal with this every day. Mismatches of what one part of the supply chain is providing versus what uh, another part of the supply chain is providing. So optimizing across all that at the system level is non-trivial. Okay. Okay. Um, so now let's spend the rest of this session, uh, just not too many slides, a few slides talking about, like we all did with all our other sessions, what are the reliability risks? Now that you understand the basic anatomy and what kinds of materials are used in printed circuit boards, what are the failure risks? How many different ways can PWBs fail? Okay. So microvias, we'll start with the microvias. We did that most recently, so we'll talk about that. Remember, microvias are being built up layer by layer. So you have copper on this layer, then you put down polymer on the next layer, you drill down, and then you plate. Well, that plating has to adhere sufficiently well to the copper that was there from the previous layer. If it doesn't, then the thermal expansion of the polymer in the vertical direction is just going to rip open that interface if that interface was weak, and now you've lost all electrical continuity. Okay? So uh, that's a common failure mode that we see. That's a manufacturing process. Basically what happened is when this was drilled, they didn't clean that copper underneath uh, well enough. So when they plated new copper, it never bonded sufficiently well to the copper that was underneath, the copper land or pad that was underneath. And now during operation, they delaminate and that's a failure. Other failures that we see are uh, irregularities in the plating itself. So the plating never formed properly. This is called dog boning, that means uh, you get a lot of copper at the top, but the, uh, doesn't, uh, the co uh, copper in the copper bath doesn't penetrate through the, in the depth direction sufficiently well, and the plating gets thinner and thinner by the time you get to the bottom. It's very thin. Now think of what happens. Where if, during temperature cycling and power cycling, this polymer is going to expand, push up on that copper. You have a very thin web connecting it. It just tears because it doesn't have sufficient strength to fight that thermal expansion. Uh, if the via so if this is a filled via, you don't have as much of a problem. Filled via will still have this problem. It won't have that problem. Yes. Okay. And then uh, sometimes you have these excessive folds that form. Where if, uh, if this angle of the drill is not quite right, uh, you've overetched it, then you form these folds. And sometimes we find those folds form stress concentrations. And with repeated uh, pushing up and down during temperature cycling, this opens and closes, opens and closes. It's like bending a paper clip back and forth. It eventually, you get fatigue failures over there. Once again, if this was a filled via, that would not have been an issue. Okay. Uh, the thing is also, in the filled via, mm -hmm. we have like two types of Okay. One is a dielectric filling and one is a... Ah, filling. yes. So if it's a conductive filling, it won't be an issue, but dielectric... <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. And uh, the other issue with filling that we have seen is filling sometimes is not perfect, leaves behind voids. So you get partial filling, and especially if you have stacked vias, and we'll talk more about this in day five, if you have stacked vias with large uh, voids that got left behind, those act as stress concentration sites and make things worse. It's worse than not filling because now you have a stress concentration in that, uh, around that opening. Okay. okay. Um, 
let's also talk about, so that's in micro via failure, but regular vias like plated through hole. So here, for example, is a reasonably high aspect ratio plated through hole. You can see there are a lot of layers in the circuit card, okay? Each of these metallizations uh, are on one uh, layer, so you can see there are many layers. And uh, this has to be the vias are drilled and plated after all that lamination. So during the plating bath has to be able to plate the copper through that entire depth. So that's a lot of depth for the copper ions to migrate through and plate. As a result, you can find that the copper generally is thicker here than it is down here. The copper just in the copper ions just didn't travel well enough to the interior. So you get this kind of, again, the term for that is dog boning. It's thicker over here than it is over here. Mm -hmm. And now again, what happens is when you uh, uh, heat and cool this board due to temperature cycling and power cycling, I've, I'll use this cartoon to explain that. So this is at normal temperature. Nothing is deformed here. If you heat it up, remember <coughs> we talked about the fact that all your fabric reinforcement is in the in-plane direction. There's no fabric in the vertical direction, thickness direction. As a result, the CTE of the board in the thickness direction is huge, 40 to 70, depending on the design and the materials. Copper CT is what? 20, 20, 22. So you have a huge CT mismatch. The board is expanding a lot. The copper is not, so the copper is getting mechanically stretched. Uh, conversely, when it shrinks, when you cool it down, the board shrinks a lot in the thickness direction. The copper cannot. The copper is going into compression. You do that enough number of times, you can fatigue the barrel of that copper or fatigue those shoulders between the land and the barrel. Uh, and especially when you have such uh, marginal plating, very thin, rough, wavy surfaces with stress concentrations, they can crack very easily. So you form fatigue cracks, and those fatigue cracks slowly grow circumferentially, and ultimately you've got an open, and then you've got a plated through hole failure because the signal cannot travel through the thickness anymore. Sometimes you have very interesting phenomena where you form a crack and it starts to propagate circumferentially, but instead of closing on itself, it forms a spiral. You haven't lost any continuity. Think about it. You've got a cylinder, okay? That copper, is, think about this copper barrel. Think about this copper barrel as a cylinder. A crack starts here on the cylinder and instead of going around the perimeter and closing on itself and splitting the cylinder into two, it's gone like this, okay, spiral, uh, like a helix. So now it's, it, can, uh, it has a lot of compliance because it can, because of that spiral crack, the uh, cylinder can extend a lot, but electrically it's connected. And because it can stretch a lot, now it's very compliant. So now no matter how much you want to stretch it, it says, oh, I have the mechanical compliance, I'll just stretch with you, I have no problem. And those will never fail. Electrically, those will never fail. Now, so if you're lucky and you got a spiral crack, those vias are good for next 100 years. Okay, you're, uh, you don't have that, Whatever else fails, it won't be a via. So if that vias getting connected in any of the internal Ah, so if that crack went through an internal pad, it's a problem. But if it didn't go through an internal pad, you're fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, that's, that's the physics of the failure. But uh, obviously, like everything else, defects will, uh, will aggravate those, like we said, plating defects. So uh, uniformity of the plating, roughness of the drill hole. So that's, again, a big problem, by the way. Uh, how rough that surface is drives the plated through hole reliability. So uh, someone like you who's lived in the world of quality of pl uh, printed circuit boards, I'm sure you used to worry about uh, drill sharpness because after every so many hundred holes, the drill gets blunt and then you get rough holes, so, and then you get terrible plated through holes after that. When you plate a rough hole, you get a terrible uh, uh, plated through hole. Uh, then adhesion of that copper to the PWB material. If that pulls away, like I've shown over here, again, that's a problem, okay? So adhesion is a, a problem. Eccentricity, that's uh, if you had pre-drilled holes, when you align them and laminate them, if the holes didn't line up properly or the pads didn't line up properly, so if the pad on this one didn't line up properly with the pad on the next one. Those are all eccentricity problems, okay? So other than that, well, so those are the manufacturing flaws, but the regular features that drive the magnitude of the stress is uh, the normal thickness, so you would design a certain plating thickness. The aspect ratio governs how much stresses you're gonna see. The spacing between neighboring plated through holes drives how much space, uh, stresses you're gonna see. And I'll give you a simple example. 
if you have a lot of plated through holes next to each other, then they act like the uh, reinforcement. So if I have a lot of plated through holes in some area, they are, think about they're acting like rivets through the thickness, okay? They are helping each other load share, so when the, when the circuit card wants to expand out of plane, they're all saying, no, 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 we're all here, we got each other's back, we're gonna fight that expansion together. As opposed to that, one lone V out there has to fight the expansion all by itself, carries a much higher stress. So it's a matter of load sharing. So if there are a lot of plated through hole, if the plated through hole density is very high in some region, you don't get plated through hole failures there. You get these single plated through holes that fail first. So that's why spacing is important. Pad radius is important mostly because uh, of the uh, pullout. Uh, so uh, th this kind of a problem. If there's a good pad and anchoring, then you won't get this kind of a loss of adhesion and pullout. So the uh, pad size is important for that. Also the pad size is important because of the eccentricity. If, if you have a big enough pad, you can tolerate more eccentricity. If you have s very uh, small diameter pads, you cannot tolerate a lot of eccentricity. Then the board material, that basically says what's the CTE of the board material and what's the stiffness of the board material in the thickness direction. That's, what we interest, uh, that's why the board material is important. The plating material, it's copper, but there's copper and there's copper and there's copper. No two boards have the same copper. What do I mean? It's plated copper, plating bats have contaminants, no two shifts produce exactly the same kind of copper, therefore uh, the vias on this board, may, the copper may have quite a bit of ductility. What do we mean by ductility? The strain that the copper can withstand before it fails, okay? The ultimate strain at failure. So some of these vias may have a very good ductile copper, some of them the copper may not have that much ductility. So that depends on all the contaminants in the bath, the plating bath. So the plating material is extremely important, or quality of the plating material is extremely important. And then, just like microvias, we also fill regular vias. So sometimes they'll be filled with other either dielectric materials or conducting materials, or even if not filled, we'll put down another layer sometimes of nickel over them. So presence of those help reliability, okay? So whether you have a filler material or not also guides reliability. So that's failures of plated through holes. Uh, they, they tend to be somewhat of a headache, and uh, that's why a lot of attention goes into m designing and building plated through holes correctly. Okay, here's another kind of a strange problem that we have studied over the years. Uh, it was brought to us by a sponsor we're not allowed to name a uh, long time ago, almost 20, 25 years ago, and the problem has never gone away, it's still there. Mostly in power electronics, high, uh, high uh, well, boards with high voltages and high current densities. Uh, but we are starting to see with smaller and smaller feature sizes, we are starting to see more and more and smaller and smaller boards, or, or regular, uh, uh, regular functional boards, not just high voltage boards. What's the failure here? Well, and I apologize for the quality of the graphics here, it did not come through properly. What I'm trying to draw over here is a cross section of a fabric weave. So this is the thickness direction. The vertical direction is the thickness direction of the PWB. The horizontal direction is the in-plane direction of the PWB. You're looking at a cross section. And you're looking at two plated through holes side by side going through that PWB, okay? And notice this line, dark line I've tried to draw in parallel to that yarn bundle, okay? So what is that dark line? That dark line is uh, copper migrating from one via. So the, each of these vias is at a different potential. That means there's a potential gradient across these two vias. And copper has migrated from one to the other uh, and formed an electrical short. So if there's in, power, in uh, high power boards where you have fairly high voltage gradient sometimes between different metallizations, we see these kinds of uh, metal migration in buried layers. We're not talking on the surface. We're talking about in buried layers. You cannot see them. They're not visible to the eye. They're in the buried layers, but they're happening. And it basically happens in a, as a two-step process. First, what happens is uh, due to repeated temperature cycling, if the glass fabric had not bonded very well to the resin, the, the FR4 resin, then the glass slowly debonds. Okay, so go back and look at what that cross-section looks like. Okay, let's go to enlarge, okay. So here's glass. CT of glass is about three to five parts per million per degree C. The resin has a CT of about 
40 to 45 parts per million per degree C. Okay? The saving grace is, and, and the glass is very stiff. The saving grace is the resin is very compliant, so if the glass says, no, I'm not going to expand, the resin says, oh, fine, I'll just not expand with you uh, because it's so compliant. Okay? Uh, but the point is there's still a mismatch at the end of the day, and if you keep heating and cooling this enough number of times, slowly that CT mismatch, stresses due to the CT mismatch of that interface, will debond that interface. Once that interface debonds, now you have an air gap that has formed, you have an air gap that has formed, so that fiber has debonded from the resin, you have an air gap all along the length of it. Moisture slowly gets into it over time, and now you've got a voltage gradient with moisture, perfect recipe for electrochemical migration. Copper starts to migrate from anode to cathode, and uh, that's the end of that circuit card. You're going to get short, and that's the end of it. So it's a two-step process. So in terms of why is that important? Because that's how much life you have. The time it takes to debond it, and the better the bonding. So these uh, people who make these pre not pre people who make these laminates are very, very cautious about making good interfaces. So the glass fibers are all treated with bonding agents, okay, so that you get a good interface, but still there's manufacturing defects and some, a few fibers will not be bonded that well, those are the culprits. But again, it doesn't debond on day one, it takes some time of thermal cycling for it to debond. So that's part of the usable life of the product. And then after it's debonded, it takes time for the filament to grow. So the time taken for both of those steps is the time you have to use the product. At the end of it, the product's dead. Okay? Unfortunately, because of manufacturing defects, sometimes you don't have the luxury of that step one, which means on day one, metal can start migrating. Why? Because some of these glass fibers are not rods. You saw the cross-section, they're solid rods. Some of them are not. Some of them are hollow rods, unfortunately. So if you look at the cross-section, some glass fibers are solid, some are circular, uh, uh, annular. So they have a, a hollow core in the middle. Why? How are these glass fibers formed? From glass melt through protrusion. So you have a die in a melt, and you pull these long fibers out, they solidify, and that's how fibers are formed. Well, if air bubbles get trapped at the mouth of the dye in the melt, when you're pulling it out, those air bubbles get extruded out into long cylindrical voids. And then when you chop off those fibers to make these laminates, you basically have a fiber with uh, uh, glass fiber uh, with holes all through the thickness. So, and we have observed those. So you can actually, the way to observe them is you take the fabric, you uh, uh, immerse it in some liquid, shine a light, and by total internal reflection, the ones that are, well, you put it in a special fluid that is index matched, index or refraction matched with glass. The ones that have air inside them will get a total internal reflection and then they'll light up. You can see the hollow fibers uh, very quickly and the rest of the dark ones are uh, solid fibers. Uh, so you can actually inspect and see whether, how much, what density of hollow fibers you have. So people who make power electronics spend a lot of money, or high-end electronics spend a lot of money buying hollow free glass from glass uh, fabric manufacturers at much higher cost because these have been supposedly made to a higher quality and so on. But even in batches like that, we have actually brought in those batches, looked at them in our labs, and we found uh, defect densities there too. So they're not foolproof, unfortunately. So think about it, the time you had for degradation is gone, right from day one you're starting to migrate copper and that's the end of it. So do we see CF failures? Unfortunately, quite a bit, okay. Okay, and then corrosion, any as exposed metallization will cause corrosion. Uh, the metallization surfaces can be leads, solder joints, uh, uh, the traces on the board if there's no uh, coating on them or solder mask on them, any other contacts for connectors, uh, bus bars, the plated through holes and vias. So anywhere where there's exposed metal, you can get corrosion from the environment. And that can lead to open circuits, short circuits. They'll change the electrical characteristics, cause delay, attenuation, signal distortion, crosstalk, delta I noise, all of that kinds of problems. Okay. Okay. Uh, last one, last slide. We also see uh, in poorly made laminates, we see unfortunately 
delamination. This is a particularly bad example. Not every case looks this bad. This is delaminated completely, but we do see partial delaminations in quite a few substrates, unfortunately. And that has to do with manufacturing quality of the substrates, okay, how well they were bonded and so on. Uh, so it has to do with how good the adhesion was. Uh, so whether the copper that you, the copper rolls was treated well, at the, whether the surface was treated well for adhesion or not, that's what drives this. Uh, and even if they were reasonable on day one, they do degrade with time. So unless they were really robust, they don't survive the entire life cycle to degrade with time and eventually delaminate. And uh, basically, it's, a, it's an evidence of poor manufacturing. Okay? Uh, so it's a combination of poor manufacturing to start with and then environmental degradation from there on out. And of course, that kind of delamination is simply not tolerable because that changes all the electrical properties, moisture gets in, mechanical stresses on, through thickness interconnects, you name it, it's a problem. Okay, all right, so that's where we'll stop with uh, PWB. The next session, which I think will probably have to be tomorrow, uh, I mean on Monday, will be assembly. So we've talked about components, we've talked about printed wiring boards, now we've got to assemble those components on the printed wiring board, basically soldering on. Uh, or conductive adhesives, uh, solders, any kind of <coughs> joining assembly technologies. Uh, so we'll talk about those. Again, why? Because my goal is to talk at the end of the day, what kinds of defects can you have over there and what kind of failure mechanisms can you get at the assembly level. At every stage, my interest is highlight what are the possibilities, opportunities for failure, what are the risks for failure, okay? So we'll start that session on uh, Monday. Okay, thank you. Everyone's looking tired. Take